So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Kathleen Law with Pollinator Partnership. And tonight we uh, will be having our very first uh, fall webinar in our series from Project Swallowtail, From Seeds to Seedlings with Pete Ewens. So uh, many of you will already be familiar with Project Swallowtail because you are participants in the project, um, either individual participants or block ambassadors. And so Project Swallowtail is a really exciting and wonderful collaborative approach to conservation in an urban setting. So our project area is in West Toronto, as you can see here on the map. And in our project area, we have some really significant habitat sites. So we have High Park, of course, which you can see on the left of the screen there, the big green rectangle. We also have a lot of uh, significant habitat along the Lakeshore Trail and several other city parks, as well as the uh, Toronto Rail Path. Um, and part of our project, part of the ambition of this project is to connect these pieces of habitat by engaging residents in this area to plant uh, native plants in their gardens to increase habitat for pollinators and for swallowtail butterfly species in particular. So as I mentioned, my name is Kathleen Law. I'm the Integrated Conservation Manager with Pollinator Partnership Canada. My contact info is there. I welcome you to send me an email if you have any questions or comments. Um, my work uh, involves uh, this community project, of course, but I also work often with uh, farmers and municipal agencies and government departments and various land managers on how to integrate conservation practices into day-to-day -day operations, whether it's by reducing mowing or using native plants in revegetation projects. Also with us this evening, we have the wonderful Colleen Cirillo, who is not only one of Project Swallowtail's lead block ambassadors, but also uh, our volunteer coordinator. And Colleen has many years of experience in uh, outdoor and environmental education. Uh, she's worked with the Toronto Region Conservation uh, authority. She's worked with Ontario Nature and she's also worked with Toronto, Bota uh, Toronto Botanical Gardens. Uh, she also sits on the board of LEAF, uh, Local Enhancement and Appreciation, Appreciation of Forests here in Toronto, uh, who's one of our more recent Project Swallowtail members. So for everyone in West Toronto, we do encourage you to check out our LEAF campaign our joint project Swallowtail and Leaf campaign and um, find out more about the trees and shrubs that you can plant. And of course, tonight, we are very happy to uh, welcome uh, Pete Ewens as our presenter. Pete is giving us this wonderful webinar from Seeds to Seedlings. Pete was raised in the countryside in the UK and with binoculars, a Jack Russell Terrio, and numerous footpaths for exploring the natural world wherever possible. Uh, he, he has decades of experience in conservation. Uh, he's worked at the world famous Fair Isle Bird Observatory. He also worked for the UK government as a, the Nature Conservancy Council Officer for Shetland and then Hertfordshire. He completed his doctoral, doctoral work on black guillemots in relation to the offshore oil industry. He eventually moved to Canada in 1990, 1990 sorry, and worked in the Great Lakes Wildlife Toxicology Programs for the federal government's Canadian Wildlife Service. He joined the World Wildlife Fund Canada as director of Canada's Endangered Species Program in 1996 and then led WWF's Arctic Conservation Work from 2000 to 2006. Um, and that's probably where he got his moniker, uh, polar bear Pete. Uh, Pete was lead specialist for WWF's Canadian species conservation work from 2007 up until just recently in 2020. His work centered on flagship species conservation in globally significant regions such as whales and polar bears, accelerating the recovery of species at risk and increasing the connection of urban citizens to wildlife species and their needs and that is indeed what we're doing tonight. Pete has also published over 100 scientific papers and book chapters. In the last few years, he's been very active in wildlife, ha wildlife habitat restoration in urban areas, and particularly through In the Zone, which is a program from uh, uh, Carolyn Canada Coalition. And now, Pete, as I said, is one of our lead block ambassadors and an extremely experienced uh, grower of native plants. So, Pete, welcome to, uh, to your webinar, and we're so happy to have you on you. board. 
great to be here and let's hope the digital things work good. So I think I'll switch screens over to you, Pete, so you can sh start sharing your PDFs or PowerPoints, pardon me. Oh, I see, okay. Are you switched already? Um, I stopped. I stopped sharing, so you should be okay. able to start sharing your screen. Right. I should be sharing my screen now. Is it working? It is. Yes. Okay. Okay, everybody. So, can you see that? Okay. Yes, we can. All right. Do you so, want to make it uh, full screen? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't want to. I want to leave. Okay some of the background because I'm going to draw on the videos just on the side here. So I'm a cautious user of the computer. Right. So there's my coordinates. Um, as um, Kathleen said, you know, send me an email, phone number, anytime, any questions, but put your questions as I'm talking through for about 30 minutes here um, in the Q and a room. And Colleen is going to be trying to help, uh, answer some of those uh, things. But anyway, this talk from seeds to seedlings is all about um, increasing the number of native plants in your West Toronto pollinator garden uh, at actually <laughs> no cost to you. You have the option of going out uh, to one of the really good nurseries that specialize in native plants or online. But um, this is about homegrown uh, seedlings and how to do it, the basic form of uh, the technique. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, just a quick introduction and the scope. Um, then we're going to have really two main sections. The first one is going to be about how to collect some of these uh, seeds that we're after and how to store them. And the second section is about uh, really three main options for germinating those seeds uh, so that they're there in pots in May when we're all hopefully vaccinated and able to whiz out and uh, do all sorts of things that we can't do right now. And then we'll finish with the Q&A. So uh, that was a long uh, bio from um, Kathleen, but w one confession here that uh, isn't in my bio, but it's important uh, for those of you who've got kids and grandkids uh, or neighbors, kids who have no interest apparently in uh, gardening. So my brother and I um, paid little attention and actually hated the idea uh, of our parents always gardening. And they were from horticulture and farming backgrounds in the UK. And so that was the last thing we wanted to do. So it looked like we were definitely not interested in gardening. Well, guess what? Um, now in our 60s, we're both really keen, quite good gardeners. Uh, so obviously some sort of seed was sown when we were, you know, six or eight or 10 years old. But anyway, I went on to do different kinds of science, uh, um, marine, Arctic, etc. Um, ornithology, general ecology and conservation biology. But what I'm really interested in now, because the world is trending in the wrong direction, is connecting urban people. 83% um, of Canadians live in, in cities and big urban areas um, and getting them out, doing something uh, with the green space around them. As I often say, just putting dirt under your fingernails gets you out in touch with nature, whether you're growing local food, which has really taken off, uh, thanks to the coronavirus, actually, um, or at the same time, uh, putting in some native plants uh, for bees and other great pollinators who will then flip the other side of the garden and pollinate your, your vegetables. Thank you very much. But a lot of this is centered on the emotional attachment people have to their home place. And that is central to this whole push and the reason why I uh, now not uh, working full time, I'm dedicating as much time as I can now to Project Swallowtail to just um, motivate people and empower them to take that asphalt and lawn 
away one square meter at a time and put in things like in the bottom picture there which is my uh, diverse garden which is just a real oasis that produces a lot of great things okay uh, this is DIY, do-it-yourself, that's what we're about tonight. We're going to focus on how to collect the right seeds and when, uh, how to store them, then germinate through to spring. And I'm going to focus very much on small plants, not uh, trees or shrubs. So, first section, seed collecting and storage. Um, I started into this uh, three or so years ago and of course made a bit of a mistake in that I was wanting all the colorful uh, native plants um, but a lot of the gardens in West Toronto actually have partial shade or quite often full shade conditions so we need to make sure we're putting at least as much effort into plants that are suited to shade so that's the targeting species as as the milkweeds and all the bergamots and colorful plants that you see basking in the sunshine. Uh, the timing of seed collecting is really uh, June through to November. We'll come to that in a minute, especially important for the spring ephemerals. You've got to actually monitor them and get in there before they drop their seeds. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the materials you need to do this seed collection and storage, which are minimal, <laughs> didn't cost me anything. Uh, a bit of protocol stuff on permissions, uh, locations. I'm not here talking at all about um, public parks. You're not technically allowed to collect seed from parks without a permit. Um, this is more roadsides or especially people's gardens, uh, including my own garden. Um, a little bit around the techniques for collecting and then cleaning the seed and some references on the slide and I think Kathleen this talk will be posted on the Project Swallowtail website. Um, it's being recorded now and you'll be able to then see the slide with the different URLs to what I believe are the best uh, websites resources for further specific guidance. Okay now we're gonna really challenge my skills but um, if we're doing okay, rather than me sitting here in my basement, uh, we're going to take me out to outdoors. And we'll see, here we are in Colleen's garden. And we're going to play this one. Okay, so here we are in a partial shade, partial sun. Do you hear that? Okay. Garden in Roncesvalles. Uh, this is Canada anemone. Yes. And now, uh, 28th of July, great time to be harvesting the seeds. Um, some of them have dropped already, but here we can see right at the top where the flower used to be, there's a maturing um, seed head. It's probably got 20 seeds on there, and there's a lot of seeds, so we can just pick this off. Um, careful, because they're fairly brittle now. And here you can see, these seeds are they're green at the edges, but in the middle, there's a kernel which is already starting to turn brown and I'm assured that that brown core seed where it's lumpy is the best uh, and that size the bigger the better you can just take those put them in an envelope let them dry and that's your seed already collected and there's obviously a lot of seed here good okay so that was taken in June actually and this next one a little bit later, I think this one was taken in July. This is wild bergamot, uh, similar short video. Here, coming up for mid-August, and the first of the wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa heads, are drying off. This plant obviously was the first to flower, and when the seed heads get just like that, best thing to do, snap them off. You can put them all in a bag and shake it, but what you're doing is shaking out the tiny seeds here if you crumble it. You can see there, the little pale brown things, all of these guys are seeds and those uh, will have a good germination rate. Keep them in paper bag and germinate next spring. Okay. Here, coming up for mid-August. Okay, that worked okay, Colleen, Kathleen? It worked for me, I heard everything, yes. Okay, great. 
Okay, so I see that my fingernails really were quite dirty, <laughs> but I love being in the garden. And actually, so many of our, our neighbors in Project Swallowtail have been saying the same thing. So they're just loving uh, the opportunity to upgrade their garden and do some useful things. So uh, I made the point earlier, but this slide um, underscores it, that for these gorgeous first uh, spring ephemerals that come out really before the big trees have got their leaves on, uh, you've got to be looking closely at their ripening seeds and then the collection of the seeds from late May onwards uh, into June really. Here we've got foam flower, that was a pretty early May flower. This is um, Jacob's Ladder, one of my favorites, and then the wild columbine. And uh, all of those things, you know, by the time you get to July, um, you really should have collected those seeds and stored them in the envelopes for the following year. How do you tell whether the seeds are ready? This is a good question. Um, rule of thumb is if it turns brown and looks dry, um, snap off the head. Here this is green-headed coneflower, exactly the prime time to uh, take it. You have to actually beat the um, goldfinches because they'll come in and pull all this apart and take the seeds out and uh, similarly in my front yard this is um, Thalictrum tall meadow rue and these even though it flowers early it's a partly shady um, area under my white elm tree and these seeds are not ready for collection see some of them are starting to turn yellow and it was actually well into July and August before uh, these ones started turning brown. But as soon as I touched them to pull them off um, and, and put them into my hand in the bag, it was obvious that they were, they were ready to come off. So uh, here's just a few other examples. These are definitely ready. This is uh, Nodding Wild Onion, beautiful big black seed. Some of these are already just uh, fallen off on their own. Um, and this is common milkweed with the large milkweed bug in it. Um, if you want to collect these seeds, it's pretty easy. I wouldn't leave it this late. For all of the milkweeds, you actually should take the seed pod off just as it's starting to split and then squeeze the white papai and then with your thumbnail, uh, comb off the seeds into an envelope. But I actually don't advocate uh, planting common milkweed because uh, many of the other milkweed species are, are much better, far less aggressive in the garden and uh, easy to manage. And they're actually favored by monarch caterpillars, um, particularly the um, tuberosa, the butterfly milkweed. And then the new one that I've been growing uh, this year, I love it, um, Asclepius vert Ticillata, uh, whorled milkweed. It's really small, only a couple of feet high, but beautiful, long-lasting white flowers that the uh, insects love. So, you know, swamp milkweed is really the best one of all, or red milkweed as it's called, because it just flowers for so long. So um, the kits that Colleen will say something about later, um, we're going to have quite a few seeds of these three um, milkweed species, butterfly, world, and uh, swamp or red milkweed. Okay, so to sum up for seed collecting and storage, uh, you just need a lot of the little coin envelopes or any other small paper bag envelopes um, looking kind of like, like this. This is some of my world milkweed seeds. You can keep the, keep the top open so that once you've made sure they're dry, you pop them in and uh, just you can either hang it up or keep them in an old shoe box, but in somewhere that's dry. Don't let them get moist and buggy. Uh, an old kitchen sieve, they come uh, 1 16th of an inch and uh, that's perfectly good. You can buy at uh, Lee Valley and others finer scale sieves for the small seeds like uh, bergamot and um, cardinal flower and other things. And then get yourself some good Sharpies uh, to make sure you haven't, <laughs> you know, got a faded pencil mark. But that's, it doesn't really cost anything. Um, 
make sure you ask permission of somebody who you think has a plant you want to grab their seed and in the wild uh, the general rule of thumb and further down here you see all these um, websites there was a 10 to perhaps 15 percent maximum of the seed harvest uh, you can collect but you have to be wary that uh, you're not there five minutes after somebody else has also been collecting 10 percent and so ad infinitum but in my garden I um, I collect more than 10 percent because really that seed production is for me to germinate and give to you guys uh, and other people and my plants are fine and they sell seed anyway so I can take in my garden much higher proportions of the uh, annual seed production uh, further down here of course are probably seven or eight uh, websites that many people who advise me um, have actually been able to um, tell me that they're reliable sources, so particularly Prairie Moon Nursery in Wisconsin. And uh, there's the website address. North American Native Plant Society has got a lot of good resources on, including seed collection, as has um, the USDA, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's all there. How are we doing, Kathleen and Colleen? Every sound and vis visuals okay? It's looking good to me, Pete. Me too. Okay, that's good. So one final part of the seed uh, collection thing is when you're snapping the, the heads off, you can cut them off, you collect them. Sometimes you can shake up in a, in a bag or in, in a closed uh, bucket pot and that gets some of the seeds off. But uh, you also, even with a 16 inch sieve, you end up down at the bottom here, you've got some of the chaff in there. And you know, you can shake it a bit and blow some of the lighter bits off. Or if you really want to, you can have an even finer sieve to make sure you've just got the seeds more separated from the chaff. But what I do is I'm happy with what's there at the bottom right, uh, just leaving that. I don't mind the chaff because I'm scattering seeds as we'll see in a minute into trays um, and um, as long as the seeds go in uh, I don't mind if there's a bit of chaff there too so that's clean enough for me and storing uh, I here am going to play yeah video number three rather than me talking here we go and see if this works All right. Oh, board. Oh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> <Okay>, director. <laughs> That's Colleen. You'll have to signal. Okay, put your thumb up when you go. Action. Okay, here we are, 2nd of September, and we are collecting seeds and storing them and labeling them, ready for uh, overwintering and then germination that we'll get to in the subsequent uh, video clip. So I'm going to do two examples of seed. Um, collection and storage. This one is Canada wild rye. Beautiful, beautiful native grass, perennial. And I've already labeled it here, Elemus canadensis, put the date and the address, my backyard in West Toronto. And this one's easy because extracting the seeds with these long horns on is just simply a matter of pulling them off. Or you can even put the whole, the whole panicle into this little envelope and fill it up and I tend to leave it dry while the or open rather while the air is still high humidity at 70 80 percent here and then I can might see that up later when the um, ambient air gets gets dry then there's reduced risk of mold so there it is joins the other harvested seeds thank you okay so that leaves you with a whole bunch of seeds right moving to the second part Okay, we want to germinate them, and uh, in my way of looking at this, there are really three main options for germination. Um, option one is to get those seeds into the ground before the frost. We'll talk about that now. Option two is um, putting them in outdoors trays uh, with squirrel guards on, before the frost and this is what the kit that Colleen's going to talk about later is all about 
Uh, and the third option is using um, your refrigerator to cold moist stratify the seed to um, break the dormancy and you start that uh, germination indoors and get them to outdoors uh, once you get into May and June. So this first option, uh, I'm giving you an example here. The bottom left picture is Fairview Nursing Home. Of course, it's under COVID lockdown now. It's near Gladstone and Dundas. And one of the residents pre-COVID um, came to us and said they were really bored with the lawn outside. Couldn't we make some butterflies and bees come? So we took that opportunity to um, work with the community, the school, uh, local families, and uh, one or two of the people who work at the senior center took the grass away in uh, November uh, in year one, um, scalped off what we thought were all the roots and things, and then just basically scattered seed and put some leaves on top and the snow did its thing. And within a year and a half, that is what you see, this fantastic array of native plants. And of course, behind those windows is where all the seniors have their uh, meals <laughs> every day. And that was a big success. But what's hidden there is the amount of weeding that we needed to do. Um, you know, there's a shovel and some gout weed, but we didn't get all of the roots in the upper nine inches of soil. So quite a bit of selective weeding was necessary because we hadn't um, essentially sterilized the ground before we introduced our native seeds. Um, so if you do this fall sowing, um, you should really have prepared the ground either the way I described or um, more commonly with what's called solarization, where you peg down, weight down landscape fabric or old carpeting uh, for the whole summer to essentially bake everything in the top six inches of soil with black body absorption of the sun's heat. And then you'd be ready to lift that off in say October uh, time and start scattering your seeds. Or you can use the layered um, paper, cardboard, newspaper, etc., lasagna method as it's called. Um, anyway, once you've got your area, um, scatter your seeds, mimic nature really, cover with a millimeter or so of soil and then some leaves. Um, make sure you mark and label where you've sown and then let nature and winter do its thing. So that's the essence of fall sowing. Uh, preparation is important though. Uh, it'll save you a lot of um, heartache on weeding later. The second option, and this is the one I have been working on and improved, and I, I like this one the best, <laughs> partly because I'm a bit lazy. Um, I don't know what to call it, but call it the outdoors tray method. So this is, these, these are, I bought one here. These are trays that um, four inch pots come in um, when you go to the nursery. So the 15 compartments there for um, four inch pots and the tray is about you know, two inches, two and a half inches deep. And if you fill that with potting soil um, and then scatter your seed that you've collected, it might just be, well, the species, you know what it is, scatter those so uh, you've got a, a reasonable density of them, then cover it up with that chicken wire uh, or hardware cloth um, which stops the birds and squirrels getting at what you've just sown. Um, you've, you've essentially created your own little manageable uh, seed bed and you pop that tray outside and let winter and nature do its thing with all the leaves and the snow on top. I did bring here today for uh, the seed plug tray. This is a Lee Valley 72 compartment seed plug tray. Same thing as for that. And you sprinkle your, your seeds uh, in each of those, usually two or three seeds in each of those. This uh, picture on the right is 
Jack in the Pulpit, Arasima, and I've got two trays now on the go because uh, a couple of weeks ago the fruit um, ripened, and I'm hoping uh, I covered those with, of course, a bit of soil, a millimeter or two, and then some mesh. I'm hoping to be able to germinate and then give away some young Jack in the Pulpits. So I've talked a fair bit about that. There is a video, but I'm going to move on without playing that video. Um, here's an example from last year. So I did that with the seed of zigzag goldenrod. Um, my original plants came from native plants in Claremont for that. And by June, this is what my um, tray looked like. Uh, I had hundreds of zigzag goldenrod seedlings. They were getting very crowded, so I carefully um, put them into four inch pots. And then I had to create a protective, <laughs> uh, almost like a cold frame with wire to stop the squirrels digging all this stuff up. And then by the fall, this time of year last year, this is what they were looking like and covered in the late bees and butterflies. An amazing part shade plant. So that was it. The seeds to seedlings to pots and that pretty much could be you. It's incredibly satisfying to see these things growing up. Okay, that's the end of my favorite technique and Colleen will say a little bit about the, the kits that we as Project Swallowtail um, is gonna make available to uh, all of you uh, soon. The third option is uh, one that a lot of people have tried with some success, uh, cold moist stratification. I'm going to be playing a video here. Here we go. Let's see if it works. All right. Give the thumbs up and signal. All right. Okay. Now we're going to run through what you do just around Christmas, New Year, cold moist stratification for indoors simulation of what outdoors would be happening with mother nature uh, and its impact on the seeds. And it's called cold moist stratification for a reason I don't know. But basically, these many of these seeds, not all of them, but many of them um, need the freeze thaw cycle the uh, extended period of cold with some moisture scattered in there in order to be able to germinate in the spring and if you don't do that you don't get any or very much germination so for most of these seeds what I've been doing this is um, some collected big blue stem grass uh, collected these in my garden last year actually many of these seeds are viable for a number of years in these uh, paper envelopes so don't worry about seed going off. So you take these seeds, what you want to do is, is sandwich them in kitchen towel. So here, kitchen towel, you scatter these seeds in, uh, break them up individually so that yeah, they stick together in any of the grasses. There we go. So you put them in the paper towel like a sandwich and you want to keep that level and you put it in a ziplock bag and squeeze it in there so they're all spaced out in there and then just before you zip it shut you want to put some water in so i got a spray bottle you can just dribble water in with a spoon if you wanted but you moisten it up sufficient you're not over watered it's probably enough uh close them up and then you'll see how the, the towel moistens, there we go, and the seeds, as it's moist, the seeds are then bathed, immersed in moisture there, they're starting to show through. So basically you, you put that in your refrigerator in some shelf out of the way of the normal food, along with the other seeds that you want to germinate indoors come March, and you leave it in the fridge for, you know, 30 to 60 days. I mean, I, I do this for two months. And occasionally you put it in the freezer for a day, just mimicking cold natural things. 
And that is pretty simple. Okay, so that's that bit. It is pretty simple. Um, and then I'm going to, yeah, play the second video, which is about what you do. Here we go. Once you take them out of the fridge. Peat-based potting compost, ideally pro-mix with the mycorrhizal fungi, but uh, the regular Home Depot or any other stuff is good. But it's going to be potting soil, so it's inert. It hasn't got seed. It's not topsoil or anything. And you can put that uh, into any kind of container, really, but it's got to have a hole in the bottom because you're going to keep this moist. So these are the 72... Um, section plug trays. There are the 36 version from Lee Valley here. Of course the, the plug that you end up with here once your seeds germinate is going to be a lot bigger. The roots have got more space. But I find that these are the most efficient because you're going to put this in a south facing window or got a grow light. Um, but more, more plants per <laughs> square meter. So basically you've got these almost filled up. You take your seeds now out of their bag and you peel back all this moist kitchen towel and there are your seeds. Now I have used tweezers for this. Um, I usually put two seeds in per cell because you're not going to get 100% germination. And you really put these in just close to the surface uh, like that and put them at either sides of the cell etc and fill the whole thing up so that would be 140 plus seeds in here and then you want to have just a, a small sprinkling of soil on the top like that once you've sown them just pat it down a bit so you, so you can't really see the seeds and then you moisten it up, but not too much. There we are. And the early stages, use a spray bottle, it's much the best. And put that in a light, uh, lighted window. Okay, so that's fairly simple. Um, here's an example again. Uh, these were the seeds. Uh, that went through that process in the fridge uh, and produced last spring. Um, I had 90% germination rate. This is a Liatris spicata, dense blazing star. So we uh, made a lot of these available. So you can use old coffee, bean, and juice carton and yogurt cartons. You don't need to go and buy any pots. And then the next year, the second year, i.e. this um, summer, this is what they produced, amazing species, uh, which the, the bees and butterflies and flies and wasps all love. So basically this technique, here it is, it's very satisfying um, once you start putting them into these plug trays or, or broader trays in your window because everyone's got cabin fever by <laughs> late February and you're actually seeing your trays suddenly sprout within five or six days of putting them there in a south facing window or under a grow light of course uh, this is what you'll get so uh, here are some of my plants coming up I think those spiky things were the liatris um, so they're growing up and by late April early May you can uh, start on sunny days taking these outside this is a thing called uh, hardening off you, you basically take your um, little tender indoors seedlings out for a walk for an hour or two outside and further down here. Yeah, you got to keep an eye on the weather forecast and the weather because suddenly you can get hail in early May and that isn't um, very good for survival of these trays of uh, seedlings. But, you know, if you survive that, as mine did, the last couple of years then of course here's one of my big um clamps really with the uh, chicken wire 
all over the top because the squirrels just hammered uh, the, these, this soft soil and kept flicking up my plants. But if you get on top of that, uh, that's how your um, baby seeds come right through and give you fantastic seedlings. Um, if you go to the prairienursery.com website, you'll find some very nice tables uh, which summarize one species at a time. For most of the species we are dealing with here, um, the specific um, dry as opposed dry cold as opposed to cold moist stratification needs and some other notes here. It gets a bit complicated, um, but it's worth doing a bit of homework if you know the species that you actually are interested in. So there's the summary, generally a couple of cold months, whether you're outside or you're simulating it in the fridge. And there are all sorts of other um, seed treatments for specialist species. I'm not going to go into them here, but we've described the general things for most of the herbaceous plants that we're talking about. So that's the end of my spiel. I wanted um, to just take this opportunity because we're towards the end of September to just remind everybody and to ask you to remind your neighbors, leave the leaves. The leaves are the food that builds the soil for better gardens and plants and everything. So don't give them all the way to the city and just leave them where they are or even collect some more and pile them up on your, your beds because it really um, looks after the soil and all the microbes and fungi that live in the soil. Um, Thursday, October the 8th, Sandra Pella, uh, a fantastic resource in Project Swallowtail, will be giving the next webinar in this series, um, Pollinator-Friendly Fall Garden Maintenance. And I'm sure she's going to tell you a lot more than I will ever know about the soil and composting leaves and other tricks as a master gardener that she is. And, of course, get your neighbours to help uh, add to your compost uh, all winter long because that, I've learned over the, the years here, is, is the key, is, is um, building your soil structure through good vegetable material. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it back to Kathleen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pete, for this uh, really informative webinar, walking us through all the options as well as showing us how to do it with the videos. That was really, really helpful. So we actually have some questions lined up in the Q&A and I would also invite anyone who's attending, if you have any questions for Pete, please pop them into the Q&A and then uh, we can ask them um, out loud to Pete. So we'll actually go. And the first one we have uh, from Stephanie was, do you need to insulate the edges of the tray in winter? Uh, no. No, the, the little tray you're putting out with its wire cover is really just a, a mini version of the soil surface. And these seeds for native plants are, they evolved here. So you're just in a controlled way, you're putting them out to simulate how it would be in nature. Great, thank you, Pete. Um, and another question, this one is from Nadia. For the trays outside, in which month do you place those trays outside? Right, the um, method two. Um, put those out as close to the, the first frost as you can. So here I would say mid-October onwards, think about it. Uh, the reason I say don't put it now is that um, there's a lot of seeds, including Norway maple keys, flying around and they'll come through you know quarter inch chicken wire and um, start sprouting in your tray but if you leave it till the back end of october halloween there's usually not a frost before then um then you'll minimize the number of um invasive alien and other seeds that'll come in and you'll just have your seeds once you've got the leaves on top and the snow then that's all that's in your tray. Great, thank you. 
We are getting lots of great questions in the Q&A. So we have one here from Bernadette. Can you germinate native grass seed outside in the tray over the winter or do you direct sow them? I, I think you can do either, either, either. Um, any of those native grasses seem to do quite well, especially bottle brush and Canada wild rye. Just pop it with the awn sticking upwards. It seems to germinate. Whether you put it in prepared ground uh, out in your garden or in, in the tray, it doesn't seem to matter. I mean, the, the, managing the weeds at that germination stage is, is the real challenge. And that's in, you know, April, May onwards which is easier for you to manage it when it's in the tray. Great, thank you, Pete. Um, oh, another excellent question. This one is from Hope. Do all native plants require winter sowing? Well, from seeds, no, you can, you can, you can sow seeds, uh, <laughs> Well, seeds naturally fall off in the summer. Um, the spring ephemeral seeds are falling off in June, but they're not doing anything uh, until they've been oh, released from that dormancy by the, the, the frost. Thaw cycle. You could you could so. Yep, through the cold period, times of year too, but they'll just be dormant until they've been through one cycle of cold. Okay, so we lost a bit of the connection there, Pete. But I think what you're saying is, um, in nature, some of those seeds would fall uh, in summer as well as into into autumn into fall. But for best results, many of these species uh, do need that overwintering to break their dormancy. Okay, so it looks like we might be having a bit of uh, internet connectivity problems, but let's try our next question and hopefully uh, everything will uh, catch up and speed up. So from Ryan, we have the question, do you transfer uh, the seedlings to larger pots after the trays or do you plant them in the ground? Oh, so I think we're just having a bit of an internet issue. I'm not yeah, sure if it's correct. on my end. Um, Kathleen, what was that question? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if the internet yeah. is slow on my end or on, on your end. Um, but the question from Ryan was, do you transfer to larger pots after trays or do you plant directly in the ground? Yeah, I always have been potting up because uh, germination um, in those trays, uh, it, as you could see in the um, zigzag goldenrod picture, that's quite normal. It's high density. So I was thinning out and putting them into four inch pots. And, you know, if, if the seedlings are, you know, three inches high, you can put them in the ground. But I actually was letting them grow a bit more and even some that I would put into one gallon pots. So they had a really solid, well-developed um, root mass right through. And then I was planting those just last week, actually. But I, I wouldn't plant them straight into the ground from the seedling trays. I'd put them in four inch pots first. Great, thank you, Pete. Uh, so we, we have lots of questions. Thank you, everyone. This is a really great conversation. Uh, so we have maybe another five more minutes for the Q&A. So I'll try to find uh, one that uh, will help a lot of people. Um, oh, another one from Nadia. Can you indicate in which month you place all the trays outside under the chicken wire? 
Uh, do you need to create a wooden structure around them as you did? And I, if I understand correctly, Pete, this would be if you use the cold moist stratification technique. So you've started your seeds inside in the fridge and now you're going to place the trays outside once they've germinated inside. Yeah, so, so if, which month if, do you do if, that? If you're, talking, if you're taking your seedlings from inside because you um, broke their dormancy in the refrigerator, then of course you, you'll take them outside um, slowly in May and on warm days in the middle of the day. You don't, you'll kill them all if you leave them outside uh, and it's zero degrees, but, um, so, but that's in May. But uh, if, if Nadia is asking about the outdoors tray method, then of course, October, November is the time that those trays, you, you don't need anything other than just a garden to put them in a corner and let the leaves and the snow build up on top of them. Just leave them until the spring when the snow comes off and then you'll watch them start germinating. Great, thank you. Oh, we have a great question from Fang. So does rich soil, i.e. a potting mix, always work or do some wild seeds and plants prefer poor soil? Well, I've been told that the mycorrhizal injected um, pro mix, so not just potting soil with um, vermiculite and peat moss, but some uh, fungal injection there is the best. And uh, a number of the nurseries I've visited use that. But the, um, None of them are using regular soil for germinating these things. I know some people in Europe are uh, making their own um, potting soil. Uh, I'm really not an expert on that. I mean, perhaps Colleen, you or Sandra may know specifically. I've just stuck with what I've learned from the nurseries around here. And, any any potting soil it's inert it doesn't have any seed contaminants in it and that seems to be the best from the people who make a living out of this yeah. i think from my experience anyways um that that good potting soil to germinate the seed really gives it the most advantage but once you've got it started and you have a healthy seedling then you can plant your, it in poor soil because a lot of these, especially the sun-loving prairie plants, they're well adapted to poor soil. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, so how about a few more questions? Um, so for winter sowing, so the trays that are outside, do they get left in a sunny or part sun or other type of condition? Does it matter? I, I haven't... Uh found that it matters. Um, most of mine I just put in a place near to the house where I backed up, you know, often there's four, four feet of snow in a big pile on top of them. And that seemed to be fine. Great, thanks. Um, and now a follow-up question. So if you have seedlings in pots for the summer, where do you put them? Semi-shade, small pots take a beating in summer heat. Yeah, that's right. Well, the the um, type of species you're growing matters. So you want to just think about what the species niche is. And if it's a sun loving, you know, prairie species, um, you know, butterfly, oral milkweed, common milkweed, um, even small seedlings, you know, they, 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 they live in sunny conditions. But if you put any of these spring ephemeral shade, part shade plants out into the baking sun, they, they wouldn't do very well. That's been my experience. So, but if you're in doubt, I would err on the cautious side and not let them bake and dry out. Great, thanks for that piece. Here's an answer from Sandra, what she's saying. Any good potting soil will suffice. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, and a question from Stephanie. Uh, for, this is for method three, so our cold moist stratification of freeze thaw. If seeds are collected in September, I assume we would need to do dry storage for most of the winter. Is this correct? Uh, yeah, 
yeah and then in when you come to you know, february even even new year you can start your two month period in the fridge yeah but store them dry until the time that you're ready to put them in the ziploc bag with the moist sandwich uh, for a couple of months in the fridge you're sort of working back from the idea of may is when you want your little tender seedlings in their tray to be going to the garden so you can back calculate and usually usually it's january when you start taking the seeds out and putting them into the fridge right so you keep them in dry dry envelopes yeah. um up until you you germinate them in january well, up until you prepare them by putting them in the fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, how do you know which seeds need cold, moist conditions? Well, most of them do. If you're in doubt, you can, uh, you can just stick them through the refrigerator process or, I mean, you're really simulating nature the whole way. So whether you're putting them outside and just leaving them alone and, winter happens um that's that's what these seeds naturally evolved to deal with in this part of the world right so but if you go to that prairie nursery prairie moon nursery uh, website that table is the best i've seen where it's one species at a time but that's really for commercial growers so it saves them the heartache if they know like most of the native grasses for example just need to go through the cold period. They don't ne also need moisture. So uh, even though I've put bottle brush grass and big blue stem in the fridge, I didn't need to. I could have just, um, without the moisture, you know, just left it in the envelope and made sure it was got to minus 20 for a few weeks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, so I think that's all the time we have for Q&A. We only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to uh, share my screen for just a few closing slides. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I figure out where everything is here. And I will actually pass it over to Colleen, our volunteer coordinator, to tell us a bit about our, uh, our next, one of our uh, upcoming activities for Project Swallowtail. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. So we are putting together and offering these free seed kits. And these kits will consist of easy to grow from seed, native plants, seeds, and also some soil and a tray, a black tray, and some mesh that you'll put around your tray to prevent the um, larger weed seeds from coming in, but mainly to prevent the little critters like squirrels from digging up all your soil. So we're in the process of assembling these kits and we've received some very generous donations. So thank you to everyone who has donated or who is going to donate. Um, people can sign up to be recipients of the kits. They can also sign up to be contributors. Like say you have a little bit of um, native plant seed that you know you're not going to use this year. You could contact me um, and let me know and I'll come and pick it up and share it with others. The idea is that everyone who takes one of these kits home is going to grow the seeds and then in the spring say 50 percent of the plants they have they will keep for their project swallowtail team and themselves and 50 percent will go back to the project <clears throat> and those will be given away to other say organizations schools or people uh, for free so that's the plan for our our seed tray kits and that is the process that uh, pete described earlier in the webinar wonderful uh, thanks for that, Colleen. And just to note, because I know we have a lot of people who are attending uh, the webinar who uh, might not be already signed up for Project Swallowtail, uh, but they are in the project area. And we have lots of people who are watching who unfortunately aren't in the Project Swallowtail area. So um, this really is focused on, on our Project Swallowtail space. And we're going to be working mostly with block ambassadors for this, but definitely um, if we have tray, extra trays, extra seed tray kits, then we'll distribute those on a first come first serve basis to our Project Swallowtail participants. Um, and again, I think this is a really great example of the collaborative and grassroots nature of this project because we've had block ambassadors donating trays and pots, others are donating soil. 
lots of people are donating seed and all of this is coming together. We're growing it together and then it's getting redistributed throughout the community and increasing our habitat. So uh, yeah, I think this is what Project Swallowtail is all about. So that concludes our webinar for this evening, the first webinar in Project Swallowtail's fall series. So a very big thank you to Pete, who's taken the time to show us his techniques, his methods to record videos for us uh, with a hands-on approach to how to grow native plants from seeds into seedlings. And just to note, uh, as you could tell from some of those first photos, Pete has set up a do-it-yourself nursery. Last year, he grew 800 plants uh, out of his backyard, which he very generously distributed throughout the neighborhood to Project Swallowtail participants, as well as to other groups and other people. So Pete has uh, pretty much single-handedly increased uh, native plant density in our project area. So Pete, thank you for all of that and for being with us tonight and for Colleen for all the work uh, that she put in behind the scenes for, for this webinar as well as everything else she does. And I invite everyone to uh, visit the website. So it's projectswallowtail.ca. And if you're in the project area, please do sign up. We'd love to have you come on board. There are no commitments. You just get emails and you get to choose uh, what activities you want to participate in or not. So thank you very much. and. Uh, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.